Hi, everyone. Thanks for joining us today. My name is Jonathan Kerman. I'm the Director of Interventional Pulmonology at the Medical College of Wisconsin in Milwaukee, Wisconsin. Uh, and today I'm going to be talking about strategies for identifying potential patients for Zephyr valve treatment. Here's the agenda today for our discussion. Uh, first, I'll be uh, reviewing my program, talking about my treatment criteria and the workflow that I use. Then I'll be talking about how we divide internal versus external patients, followed by PFT screening and CT screening, and then emphasizing how important teamwork communication uh, and having uh, defined community criteria are. So when it comes to building a Zephyr valve program, you have to appreciate that it's an active process. It's not going to build itself. And you also need to differentiate between internal and external processes. These may have different pathways depending on the individual circumstances of your institution. It's important that you go out and meet internal and external constituents um, and establish relationships with them that will facilitate uh, referrals um, and will help you build a robust program. Um, it's important to also reach out to current and existing providers. Uh, don't neglect them. Um, even though they send you patients for other procedures, they may not be familiar with bronchoscopic lung volume reduction or BLVR. It's important to make it easy. Eliminating barriers is key here. If referring providers have to jump through a lot of of hoops in order to send a patient um, that will dissuade them. You want to identify opportunities for partnership. Um, there's a lot of different entities that can that can be involved in your BLBR program. For us, our transplant team is an integral component. There's a continual bi-directional patient flow between our bronchoscopic lung volume reduction program and our transplant program. Any patient who is referred to us for consideration of bronchoscopic lung volume reduction and who's under the age of 70 and has an FEV1 under 30% gets an automatic referral to our transplant team. In addition to being evaluated for BLBR, it's important to understand that these are not mutually exclusive treatments. These are complementary. BLVR can be a bridge to transplantation. And in some cases, if patients have a very robust response to BLVR, they may not even need a transplant anymore. Sharing success is critical. Both patients and providers really like to hear about good outcomes, and they also like to have some patient statistics as well. So if you are able to collect those, those will benefit you when you're talking to referring providers and to patients. So I launched my program in the middle of uh, 20, sorry, at the end of 2019, uh, perfect timing uh, with the ongoing pandemic, I know, but uh, that's when it happened. And since then, um, we've treated over 120 cases that were collateral ventilation negative. Um, almost 30 cases, in addition to those, were collateral ventilation positive. And then we've also done about 30 revisions as well. It's important to understand that not every procedure is going to be perfect right off the bat. And patients understand this, and this is well known. So sometimes it requires a second procedure to really get things perfectly. And patients are okay with that. Um, they'd rather um, um, uh, go forward with a second procedure uh, to get um, and to get an ideal outcome. Uh, I have two partners that I do cases with, um, and we have a dedicated nurse who oversees the entire interventional pulmonary program at my institution, but she's not a dedicated BLVR coordinator per se. Um, I know many programs have a dedicated BLVR coordinator, and if you are fortunate enough to have that, that's terrific. But I like to emphasize that I've been able to build a very robust program without having a dedicated coordinator. And so it is possible to, to do so. When I first launched my program, 
I was very, very strict about the criteria that I was using to accept uh, potential candidates. Uh, I was adhe I was adhering to the liberate criteria very, very rigidly. And since then, um, so over the past uh, four years, um, those criteria have become much more relaxed. Uh, so as you can see, I've relaxed my FEV1 criteria, my RV, um, as well as uh, the criteria in my blood gas. Um, for folks who have a pulmonary artery systolic pressure or a PASP on their transthoracic echo that is over 45%, that's okay. Many times it, it is in fact overestimated in the setting of concurrent emphysema. And so you simply need to get a right heart cath uh, to verify that they do not in fact have pulmonary hypertension. I can tell you that of all of the patients I have evaluated for my BLVR program, I've only had one ultimately be excluded because of because of of pulmonary hypertension confirmed on a right heart cath. Um, we do nuclear medicine spec CTs. It's okay if you're just doing a regular VQ scan. Ideally, having perfusion less than 30% in the target lobe um, 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 is preferred. Uh, but I have done cases with greater perfusion and they do okay. Um, it's just important to know what the perfusion is because then you can anticipate any post-operative hypoxia. Uh, and when patients know what to expect, uh, they are willing to tolerate a lot. Um, it's important to remember that patients with Fisher Integrity scores down to 80% are, are, are eligible uh, for uh, BLVR with the Zephyr valve because of the Chartist assessment, which is the pressure flow transducer catheter that allows us to confirm physiologic lack of collateral ventilation, and that's done intraoperatively. Um, and then uh, treating patients with destruction scores, or sorry, with fissure, uh, sorry, with destruction scores, 45% um, or greater at the negative 910 household units um, um, threshold is acceptable as well. You don't have to have patients who have destruction scores in the 80s or 90s uh, to benefit from this. Um, and again, this is all substantiated by very robust data. So when I was building my workflow, remember I didn't have a dedicated BLVR coordinator. Um, I was trying to, to fit this in to a busy interventional pulmonary practice um, that at the time, frankly, was very malignant disease focused, very lung cancer focused. And so time was precious uh, for me then, and it still is now. Um, and so it was important for me to make clinic visits very meaningful. And the way that I did that was by ensuring that we had all of the data up front so that when I saw patients in clinic, I could actually have a meaningful discussion with them, explain whether or not they were a candidate and why, and then make plans to move forward from there. And I thought that patients may be apprehensive about having a CT scan and an echo and pulmonary function testing done even before they saw me in clinic. But on the contrary, many were really grateful that I was setting this up so that they didn't have to have multiple visits with me uh, just to hear whether or not they were a candidate for this procedure. Um, so I've never had any um, real apprehension on the part of on the part of of the patient about getting the testing done up front. Um, so my workflow is highly automated. Uh, and again, this was a necessity because I didn't have a single person who was able to keep track of patients as they progressed through, through the testing process. So when a patient is referred to us uh, for consideration of Zephyr valves or bronchoscopic lung volume reduction, that triggers a message from my nurse saying new BLVR referral um, and my nurse has already screened them for any absolute contraindications such as active lung cancer. Um, and then I'll uh, do a quick chart review. It usually takes me less than 60 seconds. Uh, and then I'll reply back uh, with just two words, full evaluation. My nurse has then been empowered uh, through a protocol to enter all of the orders necessary for BLVR evaluation. 
That's a non-contrast CT chest done with the appropriate scan parameters like 0.63 millimeter slice thickness, a transthoracic echocardiogram done with a pulmonary hypertension protocol where we, where we request that they specifically report the pulmonary artery systolic pressure, pulmonary function testing that includes spirometry with a bronchodilator, lung volumes with body plethysmography, a six minute walk distance, um, and we had to, to really coach the respiratory therapists who were performing this not to stop patients when they would desaturate because what we're primarily looking at here is the distance, not the oxygen requirement in order to, in, in order to walk that distance. And then, and, and then an arterial blood gas after being on room air for 10 minutes. Um, so we delegate a responsibility uh, to the nurse to enter all of those orders. And then as soon as those are, are entered into the computer, we will communicate with our scheduling team who will schedule all of that testing in one half day. And then once that testing is scheduled at the same time, they will also schedule a clinic visit for approximately two weeks later. Once that CT is done, my nurse knows to upload that scan uh, to Stratix um, for quantitative analysis. And so by the time we see the patient in clinic, we have their Stratix report plus all of their testing so that we can say whether or not they're a candidate at that time and then move forward from there. Usually the only additional things that we need to do are the nuclear medicine spec CT and enroll them into pulmonary rehab. And so this creates a very streamlined process for us and for the patient. It is a single in-person visit for the testing, and then the subsequent visit can be either virtual or in-person. Um, so it is a minimum number of trips that our patients have to make to the hospital, which they appreciate. So the reason that we uh, resorted to PFT screening, again, was because I had a strong suspicion that there were a lot of patients out there that would potentially benefit from this who weren't being referred. And when I approached my hospital administration about doing something like CT scan screening, um, that was quickly shot down uh, because we didn't have the funds for it. And so we resorted to PFT screening because it was free. Uh, it didn't cost us anything. Um, we were able to utilize our current you know, PFT software and simply just look at the values that we wanted to. Um, and when I you know, first approached my respiratory therapist about doing this, um, we weren't able to query our, our, our own PFT software directly in that software at that time. Um, I tried several different routes. Um, and so uh, I approached my hospital's marketing team. Again, uh, communication is you know, really important here and utilizing your hospital's resources. And I uh, you know, talked to them, I said, hey, listen, I know that you uh, folks um, have ways of doing uh, targeted marketing campaigns um, and we have a new program, and I think that it would really lend itself to this. Um, and I'd like to identify uh, patients um, in our electronic medical record uh, that meet certain criteria um, just to make them aware that there's a new treatment out there that, that they may benefit from. And our marketing team connected me with one of our EPIC analysts. These are folks who uh, regularly query EPIC and know how to analyze data within uh, the electronic medical record, uh, and they um, educated me about a, a back-end data warehouse that is commonly used. Uh, it's called Clarity, uh, and we were able to write uh, computer code to to essentially query uh, this 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 back-end data warehouse, um, and then and then those data um, were then uh, um, populated into a normal spreadsheet that I could then use um, uh, uh, to identify patients in a user-friendly manner. And all we did was implement three search criteria initially, uh, FEV1, uh, less than 50%, RV over 140, 
and TLC over 100. Um, and if I needed to, I'll tell you that the RV over 140 is really the key parameter. Um, that's the one that will identify the vast majority of your patients. So if you just wanna look at one thing, that's it. And when I first queried uh, our PFT software going back three years, um, I, I identified around a thousand patients who met the PFT criteria that I just iterated. That was way too many patients. Uh, there was no way that I could, uh, you know, handle um, um, a thousand, uh, you, you know, patients who were um, essentially new to me. And so we need to think of an additional um, um, uh, criteria uh, that could narrow down that list. Um, so, so we implemented uh, the fact that they needed to be alive um, uh, currently, uh, and that eliminated a substantial number of, of these patients. Uh, and that's what you have to understand. Um, emphysema, when you have it at this level of severity, um, it's not a condition uh, that is benign. Um, we should think of it um, as malignant, uh, even though it's not cancer. Um, when I was first trying to launch my BLVR program, um, and this was during COVID and we had to limit resources, uh, this was considered to be an elective procedure. Um, I would argue that uh, this is the furthest thing from an elective procedure. Um, if these people uh, who are candidates for this are not receiving treatment in a timely manner, a substantial portion of them will die. Um, and so if you can use population screening uh, by looking at your PFT data to identify them, these patients are going to benefit tremendously from this. They deserve the opportunity to be evaluated uh, and they want the opportunity to be evaluated as well. I know it's cliche, uh, but teamwork really does make the dream work. Um, this is a team effort. Uh, when I launched my program, the way that I gained buy-in from all the different folks involved with this was to go out and actually meet them face-to-face. -face. So I can tell you that my PFT techs know who I am. So do my echo techs and my CT techs. I met them, I put demo valves in their hands. I said, this is a Zephyr valve. Um, and uh, the common reaction was, wow, it's so tiny. And I said, yes, um, yes it is, um, but it does amazing things. Um, <clears throat> and so I explained to them what the procedure is, what we're looking for, what we need from them. And they were so appreciative of, of just having that direct communication uh, because most physicians, most providers, uh, never go and uh, communicate directly with these groups. And they are so essential to building a comprehensive program. And I went further and a list, uh, so, I, so I went further and enlisted my PFT technicians um, um, e even further. And so now what we're trying to do is incorporate upfront screening. So when my pulmonary function techs do lung volumes and they have a patient with an RV over 140, they're giving that patient a brochure saying, hey, this is a procedure that you might benefit from, read more about it. If you're interested, let your pulmonologist know. Um, and then I've also partnered with my administrators, with my marketing team and with my liaisons as well. This is one of my uh, favorite uh, books. Um, and my favorite quote within it is, uh, the single biggest problem in communication is the illusion that it's taken place. There's no such thing with too much communication when it comes to a BLVR program. There needs to be continual multi-directional communication between you and all of the different people involved in the evaluation, as well as the referring providers. The biggest gripe that referring providers have many times is that they send a patient over and then they don't hear anything for what can be a couple months and then that patient is returned to them either with or without valves and there was no kind of updates along the way. And that's very frustrating because uh, there's a physician-patient re, patient re, re, relationship um, uh, 
Uh, and if you want to facilitate maintenance of that and, and develop rapport with your referring providers, uh, communication is essential. So what happens after you get a list of potential patients when you do pulmonary function test screening? Well, you need to be able to do something with it. Um, the list can't sit there. Those patients are not going to uh, do any good if they're just on a list somewhere, but no one is making them aware of the fact that they're potentially eligible for this. And so I work with my marketing team and my, and, and my, and my hospital legal team. And I said, you know, hey, listen, how can we make this work? Um, this is the right thing to do for patient care. Uh, but, it, but admittedly, um, I don't have a relationship with these patients. They're not my patients. Um, and so what we came up with was reaching out to their treating provider, usually the person who actually ordered the pulmonary function testing, and letting them know that their patient was potentially eligible for BLVR, and letting them know that they would be receiving a letter in the mail alerting them to this fact. Uh, this is an example of an, uh, of an email that I sent out to referring providers. And I attached a letter that you'll see here in a second to this, and it was a copy of the letter that the patients would receive. So this is the letter um, to the um, uh, to the referring provider. There was a very similar letter uh, to this that actually went out uh, to patients as well, um, and it essentially just said, "Dear Mr. Smith, based on your recent breathing tests." Um, you may be a candidate for a procedure that can help you be less short of breath. It is not surgical. Uh, it's minimally invasive. Um, it's called Zephyr valves. If you're interested, uh, please call this number. Uh, and it was um, the number to refer, uh, or, sorry, and it was the number to schedule an, an appointment uh, with myself and my team. When you're meeting with referring providers, um, it's really important um, to keep things uh, simple. Uh, pulmonologists and primary care providers, uh, they're dealing with a lot of different entities, and it's impossible for them to remember all of the different uh, criteria that are involved with BLVR. And every BLVR uh, referral, it's not just looking at a set of different numbers. You also have to look at the patient as well. Um, and so when I'm talking to referring providers, um, I will typically encourage them to refer patients who have emphysema, who are still symptomatic, even if it's just dyspnea with exertion, who are on at least a lama laba already. Um, so it's that simple. Um, if you want to incorporate um, PFT criteria as well, you could say an FEV1 less than 50 and an RV over 140. And those are the appropriate people to refer. The best patients for this procedure are the ones who get it as soon as they qualify, not when they barely qualify anymore. Um, too often we're receiving patients for consideration of this who are on seven or eight liters of oxygen, can only walk 50 meters. Um, you get the idea. Those patients are probably more appropriate for a palliative care consultation than BLVR. I wish we had seen those patients three, four, or five years ago. When I go and uh, speak with referring providers, um, typically before I can get a word out, um, they'll say something along the lines of, you know, thank you so much for coming. I actually already know about airway stents, so you don't have to tell me um, all the details. Uh, and that's when you know um, that they actually aren't aware of what BLVR really entails. These are not stents. These are valves. They're very, very different. And so it's important to reiterate some of the um, eligibility uh, criteria, um, even when referring providers say that they are familiar with it already. Remind them that you can have upper lobe or lower lobe predominant disease. It can be heterogeneous or homogeneous, and it can be from any etiology as well, whether that's smoking or alpha-1 antitrypsin related. Um, importantly, don't automatically exclude patients who have a pulmonary artery systolic pressure that's elevated on TTE. I mentioned this already. 
get a right heart cath on these people, you're going to uh, find that many of them do not in fact have actual pulmonary hypertension. Um, same for smoking. I evaluate patients who are smokers all of the time. Uh, and this has been the most powerful smoking cessation tool that I've ever seen. If you can tell someone that you can almost guarantee that you can make them less short of breath with exertion and, and have a better quality of, of life, uh, they will be highly motivated to stop smoking. Um, don't, be, don't be afraid of fissure integrity scores less than 90%. Because of the Chartist system, that's a pressure flow transducer catheter, we should be evaluating patients with fissure integrity scores all the way down to 80%. Um, and I can tell you that I have personally treated a number of patients who have had fissure integrity scores right at that 80% threshold um, who have done fantastically. Uh, and then pneumothorax does happen in these patients. It's okay. It is actually sequelae of success. When we cause lobar atelectasis, which is what we're trying to do, pneumothorax is common. It's going to occur in 20 or so percent of cases, and it lets us know that we have accomplished what we wanted to. We can get patients past it. This is definitely not a barrier to referral. Um, use different opportunities to educate your referring providers, whether it's faculty meetings or advertisements in your clinic. Don't be afraid to provide your cell phone number to referring providers. If they can access you more readily, they're gonna be more inclined to consider referral of particular patients to you. And then utilize your hospital's media and uh, marketing team as well. These are some of the posts that my hospital has put up on their social media channels, um, highlighting our success. Um, and it wasn't my hospital's marketing team that sought us out here. It was us approaching them saying, hey, we're doing great things here. We want to highlight this program. So we were active. We were proactive even um, in getting the word out there. Uh, and then uh, once you engage in this, um, it kind of starts to take off on its own. Um, this is some of the print media um, that we have uh, uh, done as well um, in, in our uh, local um, local publications. This is Milwaukee Today. Um, and then this was our um, hospital's quarterly uh, publication um, where I highlighted uh, one of my early patients' um, stories uh, who did well. Um, and I highlighted the multidisciplinary aspect of the approach that we did. And so you're really getting everyone involved here. When my liaison team goes out uh, and talks to referring providers, um, they're always bringing uh, these forms uh, and they're leaving them with the referring provider and they're providing these to thoracic surgeons, primary care providers, and pulmonologists. Um, and so it's just another reminder, another way that patients uh, can get information. So takeaway points, automate the process when possible and delegate responsibility. Um, this is going to ensure that that as a provider, you are not overwhelmed uh, by building the program so you can focus on, on building the program um, as a whole and not uh, making sure in, in, uh, um, and, not make, and, and not having to make sure individual patients are progressing uh, with their different testing. Uh, time is very precious uh, for patients and for providers. Um, if they have all of the data up front, um, that is going to make the clinic visit more meaningful for both the provider and the patient. And even if patients don't qualify, they will appreciate coming in and reviewing the testing data because many times you're gonna identify something that can help them. You'll identify pulmonary hypertension or you'll identify a medication regimen that needs to be uh, modified, et cetera. Um, identify patients internally, they are there. Think about PFT screening. Patients are going to be so grateful when you reach out to them through whatever screening method you choose to employ. Um, when I see patients in clinic who have been identified via PFT screening, uh, they say, thank you so much, Dr. Kerman. I really am so grateful that you reached out to me. I would have never known about this otherwise. I wish I had heard about this five years ago. Um, so uh, they're very, very appreciative of this. Keep your eligibility criteria simple. 
Um, that will facilitate referrals, share success when possible, communicate with referring providers, and then use your institution's resources uh, to build a robust program. Um, this sheet and the one on the next slide here can be utilized um, to help you um, um, deconstruct the elements that you need to identify in order to build a successful program and really uh, uh, get off the ground and take your program to the next level. Um, here's my uh, email address, here's my cell phone number. Uh, feel free to reach out to me anytime. I'm always happy to help uh, and provide input um, as you go through this journey. Uh, good luck with everything.